the jamming on the gas, right? This this substantial deficit spending that we're seeing has probably pushed forward in time or, or, or maybe back in time. So further into this year, maybe next year, the recession that we were all expecting at the beginning of this year. But what you're saying is, is as you look at the continuation of how the deficit money is being spent and some of the issues that you know come with it, like companies maybe not wanting all the strings attached, maybe not wanting all that money necessarily, the lag effects of what the the monetary side of the house has been doing, raising cost of capital, you know, all that, as well as just a lot of the the really worrisome macro data that you and I spend a lot of our time worrying about. You think that lag effect is eventually going to overpower whatever potential stimulative inflationary effect of the remaining deficit spending is going to be. So even though we have cross currents, one of them stronger and is going to win out here in the story. Well, it certainly will be stronger if the Fed holds in place. And that really is all the Fed has to do. The Fed could theoretically later on in the fall, uh, there's a, somewhat of a 33% probability that before we ring the New Year's Eve bells uh, on January the 1st, 2024, there's about a 33% probability that we might see one more 25 basis point rate hike out of the Fed. But even that really isn't going to matter as much to commercial real estate deals that have to be refinanced. And then beginning in 2024, the reality that runs parallel to that in the corporate bond market. And that starts to be something that is, is real. Companies have done a bang up job of, of extending out their maturities. They did that when the Fed was too low for too long. But you are there is irrefutable evidence in in the bankruptcy cycle right now, in the default cycle, that a lot of companies simply cannot even contemplate looking at a higher cost of capital running their companies. I, I dare say, and I, I hate to shoot myself in the foot here because I don't want people to disregard the bankruptcy cycle, but I think a lot of companies are being preemptive about filing for chapter 11. Seeing the writing on the wall over the next six months and the fact that it doesn't look like they're going to have any kind of a pivot that takes interest rates back down to the zero bound. And that's a lot different than saying, gee, I wonder if by June of 2024, Jay Powell is going to reduce interest rates by 25 basis points or 50 basis points. Completely different dynamic than what we've grown accustomed to with his, with his three predecessors. Okay. All right. So this is all a great segue into the topic I sort of teed up in the intro, right? Which is where are bond yields headed from here? And what will that mean for the bond market, for investors, but just for the economy with this higher cost of capital? A um, number of questions for you on this, but let me just start with, with what do you think is causing the sudden move higher in yields that we've seen you know, over the past month plus? Um, and, and if I can, I just interviewed Luke Roman, and I'll give you his list, and you can, you can see whether you agree with it or you pick anything else out from it. But he said in pretty short order, We've had four destabilizing events. We've had the price of oil increase by about 20%. Um, we had the, the Bank of Japan widen out its yield curve control efforts. We had the Fitch downgrade um, of the US's credit rating. Um, and we had the US Treasury announce that it's going to borrow $1.9 trillion in the second half of this year. And you know, Lucas said, OK, those, those have all sort of contributed to, to you know, the treasury buyers getting a little spooked and saying, hey, I want a higher yield to compensate me for this risk. Um, does that sum it up? Or are there other reasons why you think that, you know, we're now staring at what, a 4.3% uh, 10 year US Treasury on the day that you and I are talking? So um, I, I think that is a good a good synopsis. But I, I venture to say that that the Fitch downgrade is actually um, you, you should reflect back on what Fitch was trying to say and look at it relative to other countries and what their position is in terms of it being one of these four big ones, as Luke would have put out there. We actually had a full-blown debate about this in my Bloomberg chat room with my institutional clients uh, just yesterday. And the only thing that we came up with as being kind of definitive for explaining this relatively inexplicable rise in in, in inflation, yes, we've seen a move in energy, but but Jay Powell has continued to, he's persistently said he's paying attention to core services and net of shelter. 
which means that he's drilling way down to determine how how resolute he's going to be in his monetary policy stance. I think we all know that energy prices move, but they move the headline. And that's not what Powell's told us his focus is. But the Bank of Japan, that was the one that was the one aspect, the one factor that nobody could really put their finger on how big of, an, of a swing factor that it has proven to be here over the last few weeks. And I venture to say that that is the biggie. And it's also the least understood because, well, my gosh, how long have we been waiting for this moment? Um, so it, it's also the, the, the most difficult to determine what the outcome is going to be. But if you look at any gauge of where the, these bond yields are, they are so stretched vis-a-vis -vis historical norms, regardless of what other series you want to slap up against them, that something tells you that right now what we're seeing is a heck of a lot of positioning and a heck of a lot of jockeying trying to get in front of the narratives that tend to rule the financial markets as opposed to the fundamentals. Okay, so all of a sudden we're seeing, you know, this narrative erupt of, oh my God, yields are going to keep going higher. Like, you know, it seems like all of a sudden people have just now beginning to buy what Powell's been saying, you know, for, for a year and a half of higher for longer, right? But now they're taking the football and they're beginning to sort of catastrophize in their minds. So the morning you and I are talking here, there was a Bloomberg article that came out that said, hey, the federal funds rate might need to go up to 6%. Right. So all of a sudden, people are beginning to say, hey, you know, this thing could really take off from here. And you're beginning to see um, articles talking about how we're just in a secularly higher era of higher cost of capital now. And all of a sudden, it was all about pivot, 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 pivot. <laughs> and, and now it's like, wow, this this we might be stuck with these higher rates for a, a long time. And of course, that's now erupting a debate um, between whether bonds and specifically U.S. Treasuries, you know, are. I've got I've got basically just as many people on the side of saying this is a historically attractive time to buy U.S. Treasuries and this is the time to start going out on duration and you can make a ton of money while sitting in safety and getting paid. And then I've got about an equal number of people suddenly on the other side of that saying, oh, my gosh, they're like a roach motel. Why would anybody be going out long duration bonds if, if yields are going to be going higher from here for the long run? Um, do you have an opinion on, on what's more likely? I think you do, but I'll let you say it. <laughs> well, I, I do because I think that 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 fundamentals can be ignored for a very long time, uh, and I think that that certainly has been the case. And you know, kind of the the it's going to be a soft landing camp grew exponentially when there was a resolution to the debt ceiling that didn't involve bloodshed. So there was this massive relief that came about after the debt ceiling was resolved. And we're now waking up to the fact that, well, okay, how are we gonna finance it? And wait a minute, those people who were burned by the debt ceiling resolution have egg all over their face. And they really are angry, those on the far right. So good luck headed into October. Oh, and by the way, even though somewhere between 45 and 60% and of Americans who are, are supposed to resume repaying their student loans, even though 45 to 60% have no intention of doing that and have been surveyed across three, four different surveys as saying, I got it. It starts on October the 1st. I'm just going to disregard it because I can uh, you know, the others who plan on resuming repayment, that occurring alongside of a budget standoff with some pretty pissed off people on the far right, that's colliding with the honeymoon about the debt ceiling ending, the layoff cycle resuming in a very dramatic fashion in real time metrics on top of the IRS finally waking up and smelling the coffee. Now that a lot of these paycheck protection program scandals are breaking, people are going to jail uh, because of the fraud. The IRS is actually trying to get in front of the employee retention credit uh, uh, wave of fraud. And it, it's actually going to have a huge economic impact at the same exact time. So slap me, Adam, if I use the term perfect storm, it's overused. But <laughs> The fact is we're seeing companies closing, bankruptcies re-erupting, what we had 10 in the month of, of July, and we're on track to have 29 
in August. In terms of cl uh, uh, companies closing on a per diem basis, according to dailyjobcuts.com, which has been around since 2009, we had about four or five companies, locations closing per day uh, throughout the summer months. It's kicked up to nine per day in August. So we've seen a definite turn in terms of money that is coming out of the economy. You're, you're, you're taking away people's income producing capacity at the same time that the employee um, retention credit went from 30 billion in the month of July, an all time record being pumped into the hands of high net worth individuals. Thank you, Mr. O'Leary Wonderman. to right now we're running closer to $17 billion as, uh, as the IRS commissioner has come out and said, we're gonna get a hold of this and we have. In fact, we're speaking to Congress about stopping it. So things are changing and three different ways they're changing happen to be happening at one time.